Hello, and welcome to this film, which is all about the principles of electrolysis. Um, and hopefully by the end of it, um, you'll understand what we mean by an electrolytic cell and what we need to make one. And you'll also be able to predict which electrode in an electrolytic cell will be the anode and cathode, and also why it's important to um, consider what your electrodes and your electrolyte are made out of in your electrolytic cell when you're trying to decide what's going to be reduced and oxidized. Okay, so first of all, we'll start off by looking at the difference between an electrolytic cell and a voltaic or galvanic cell, which hopefully you've been looking at a bit recently. Um, and we'll do that by looking at the word electrolysis itself. Okay, so it's kind of made of two um, parts, I suppose you could say. Electro, meaning to do with electricity, and lysis, meaning to break down. Okay, so electrolysis is literally breaking things down using electricity. Now, in a voltaic or a galvanic cell, the reactions want to happen. So hopefully you've looked at um, using your data sheet to predict whether reactions are feasible or not. And doing, in doing so, you can decide what reactions will take place in a battery or in a galvanic cell. Now, in an electrolytic cell, the opposite of what wants to happen happens. And that's because we're forcing things to go a certain way. And we're going to look now at how we might actually achieve that. So how we might cause something that doesn't want to happen to happen. And the answer is that here we're going to actually connect our electrodes to an external power supply. And this is very, very important, right? Because in a battery, the electricity came from the reactions taking place in the cell. In an electrolytic cell, the electricity is coming from an external power source, and that power source forces electrons down onto one of the electrodes. And because there's a lots of electrodes, uh, sorry, lots of electrons on this electrode, it's got a negative charge. Now, that means clearly that the other electrode will have a positive charge. And you might notice here that if you're someone who likes to remember that the cathode is positive and the anode is negative in galvanic cells, you might be in a little bit of trouble here because now things seem to have switched. Except I suppose that another way of looking at it is that they haven't switched at all because reduction is still happening at the cathode and oxidation is still happening at the anode. Now let's have a look at why those things will happen. Okay. Now as soon as these two electrodes become charged, if you've got any ions in your electrolyte, and if those ions can move, so perhaps your electrolyte has been melted or it's been dissolved in water, then the ions will be attracted to the oppositely charged electron, electrodes. So the positive ions, the cations, will flow to the cathode, and there's lots of electrons there, so they'll pick up electrons and they'll be reduced. That's what reduction is, a gain of electrons. The anions, so-called because they head to the anode, they're negative. They're attracted by this positive charge. When they get here, this electrode doesn't have a lot of electrons, and so these electrons are stripped from the anions, and off they head around the circuit back to the cathode. Okay, So it's this external power supply that is forcing the electrons to head in a certain direction is forcing the electrons to be given to the positive ions and it's forcing them to be taken away from the negative ions in the electrolyte. Now, let's have a look at what different types of electrolyte we might have. Okay, So why it's important to think about what kind of electrolyte we've got. Now, if you've got a molten electrolyte, that is to say you've taken your ionic solid and you've melted it. This is quite hard because they don't have very low melting points. But if you do melt an ionic substance and you end up with its ions mobile in the electrolyte, then the nice thing is about this is that when you're trying to predict what reactions will take place in this electrolytic cell, there aren't a lot of options. There's only going to be one positive ion in your electrolyte, and there's only going to be one kind of negative ion in your electrolyte. So let's say, for example, as in this example, we had lead bromide. So we've taken some lead bromide and we've melted it, so it's liquid. We've got lead 2 plus ions heading to the negative electrode where they're going to gain electrons and turn into lead. And we've got 
bromide ions, which are going to the positive electrode, they're going to be oxidized there. So this is the anode. And oops, they're going to turn into bromine and two electrons. And we're going to need two bromide ions for that. So it's very easy to predict what will happen in the electrolysis of a molten substance because there are only ever going to be two ions in there, a positive one and a negative one. However, if you've got an aqueous electrolyte, then it can become a little bit more complicated. Um, we'll just imagine that we've got copper sulfate in this beaker, partly because it's a blue solution and partly because um, this is something that we're going to look at in a lot more depth later on. Now, if we consider what ions are going to go to the positive electrode, well, we've got sulfate ions, clearly, but we've also got hydroxide ions from the water. And as far as what goes to the negative electrode and gains electrons, gets reduced, well, it could be copper ions, but it could also be H plus ions. So when we're considering what reactions might take, might take place in an electrolytic cell, it's very important we consider the nature of the electrolyte. And it's also very important that we consider the nature of the electrodes. Now, quite a lot of electrolysis will happen using what we call inert electrodes. So these ones here, although there's no reason to believe from the picture that they're inert, um, they look a little bit like graphite rods. And quite often we use graphite as an inert electrode because it's quite an unreactive substance. It's not a metal and yet it conducts electricity. So if you're going to use inert electrodes, the only reactions that can happen are the reactions of the ions in the solution. The only things that can gain and lose electrons are the ions in the solution or in the melt. Okay. However, if you've got active electrodes, that is to say electrodes that can react, like these two nickel electrodes in this diagram, then we introduce yet another possibility for the reduction and the oxidation. Okay, Because in this cell... We've got nickel sulfate as our electrolyte. Not only that, but it's aqueous. So we've got the nickel ions in the solution that could come along and gain electrons. We've got H plus ions that could gain electrons. We've got sulfate ions that could lose them. We've got hydroxide ions that could lose them. But we've also got nickel atoms that could turn into nickel ions. So if the nickel atoms of this electrode were to lose electrons, then those electrons, so this is the anode, because oxidation is taking place, then those electrons could head round the circuit in exactly the same way as electrons that were lost by hydroxide or sulfate. So once again, the possibilities for the reactions that take place, not only are they influenced by the electrolyte that you use, but also by the electrodes. So hopefully now you've got a bit of an idea of what an electrolytic cell is and using exactly the same conventions as you did with your galvanic cells, hopefully, because hopefully you didn't use charge, hopefully you know which one's going to be the anode and which one's going to be the cathode. And we've had a look also at the importance of what we use as our electrolyte and our electrodes. And we're going to look soon at, in a little bit more depth at um, what actually happens in molten electrolysis and aqueous electrolysis as well. If you've got any questions or comments then please feel free to come and see me or post a comment on YouTube.